so let me introduce uh, Mike Edelhart, the managing partner at Joyance and Social Starts, Henry Hughes, the managing partner at Cedar Hill Venture Capital, Gerda Larson, the managing director and co-founder of at The Case for Her, Aubrey Pagano, the a partner at Corrigan Ventures, and Carly Sapir, a founding partner of Reformation Ventures. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> Uh, so we ha we have a big group here, uh, and I want to start, but fortunately we have an hour, so we've got some time to really hear from everybody. So I want to start by asking you each to introduce yourselves, talk a little bit about what kind of investment you're involved in right now, and uh, Mike, I'll start with you. Uh, sure, thanks. So I'm the managing partner of two separate but cooperative sets of very early stage venture funds, Social Starts which is tracking where will social mobile technology have its next big breakthrough and Joyance partners focused on the emerging science of individual health and through health the delivery of happiness. And from each of those perspectives, this area is uh, one of our uh, active areas of investment focus. We invest at the very beginning of company. So among other things, we were uh, among the very first investors in Unbound. Excellent, thank you. And Henry? Hi, and thank you for having me today. Um, so my name is Henry Hughes, and I'm Managing Director of Cedar Hill uh, VC, which is a uh, family office style uh, venture capital uh, organization. Um, we focus on uh, early stage companies as well, seed and series A investments primarily. Um, and our mission is to improve quality of life through medical technologies, uh, consumer technologies and bi biopharmaceutical solutions. So we look for passionate founders who are looking to transform industries and improve quality of life. And Gerda? Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Gerda Larson. I run and have co-founded something called The Case for Her. The Case for Her is a philanthropic investment portfolio investing in female sexual pleasure and menstruation. But what we're really trying to do is elevate these questions to really get on the global health agenda and get big bilateral donors um, and investors, but also governments to take action and support these kind of ventures. And uh, Aubrey? Yep, I'm Aubrey uh, Pagano. I'm the news partner at Corrigin Ventures, which is a seed stage fund in New York that's focused on technologies that are transforming and reshaping the real world. So we look at companies that are using the intersection of the digital and physical to take what is traditionally an IRL industry or something that's traditionally done, um, you know, in a non-tech enabled way, and then how, you know, investing in, in places where companies can exponentially empower those experiences. Um, and yeah, we lead and co-lead seed stage deals. Excellent, and Carly? Hi, I'm Carly Safer, founding partner at Reformation Ventures. Uh, we invest in early stage startups in the women's health, wellness, and sexuality space. Um, excited to be here, and thank you so much, Martin, for putting this up. Oh, my pleasure. Um, so as you guys hopefully saw, we did a poll before your panel about what are the financial concerns of most people in the sex tech space and getting funding, which is probably not surprising, was right at the top. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about how uh, entrepreneurs can even begin to, to get a foot in the door with, with investors. Um, what are the qualities y'all look for in a founder or a company that make you think, this, this might be a potential valuable investment. And just to mix it up, let's go around in, in reverse order. Uh, Carly, I'll start with you. Yeah, um, so I think as far as how we look at investments, think it's valuable. We really look for companies that are going to be able to scale. And we look at the teams to make sure that they are the ones that should be doing it and will be able to scale the, the company. And then we also look for an impact in the women's health or sexuality space. Um, getting your foot in the door, I think coming off very professional, um, the deck having very clean deck, and also understanding your path and where you're trying to go. Um, 
I think for me, I look at cold emails, I look at cold LinkedIn's, I also look for referrals, but as long as I can see that path and the good team, I'm really excited to be speaking with founders. Excellent. What about you, Aubrey? What are you looking for when, when you meet a founder? Yeah, so that mandate of investing in things that transform the real world is a pretty broad mandate. And so when we're really looking at companies, we're looking across three things. We're looking across founder market fit, product, and then the market itself. So for founder market fit, you know, we want to believe that you were put on this earth to run this company. Um, the second, and, and that you're, you know, a leader can, can hire teams, um, can execute. The second is in product, we're looking to see any early traction data, any early product market fit, um, and sort of a robustness in the way that an entrepreneur is thinking about their product. They may have to not, you know, it doesn't have to be fully built, but um, the thought process needs to be there. And then the third is in the market, you know, showing a big vision for, for the market that you're attacking and, and why it's something that's underserved or, or where the white space is. Um, and that's definitely applies to sex tech too. So I think as, as you apply that framework to sex tech, I think that's my advice that I would give to entrepreneurs pitching. Excellent. Uh, Gerda? Yeah, no, I, I have to agree with what both former um, speakers have been saying. I, I do believe that the team is of such importance and the founder themselves, uh, a bad idea can often be, be you know, um, uh, kind of revamped into a good one, but a bad founder or a bad team can not that often be revamped into a good one. So team is definitely uh, so important. And for us, I think taking on the global health agenda in another way, we also of course look for the impact data and, uh, and when creating a deck, it's so important to have those preliminary data well, what a lot of people, I would say, do wrong is that they try to go big and they say, we sold, you know, uh, or this many people liked it, or, and then when you scratch the surface of the data, it actually comes out to be very few people. Uh, so it's better to just be open and honest and, and try to communicate directly with the investors. Um, and also have a conversation with the investor about what data they would like to see and maybe you can produce that. And what about you, Henry? You come from a more traditional background. What are you guys looking at? Yeah, thank you. Um, so certainly I agree with everything the panel's been saying so far. I wanted to approach it though from two sides. That let's talk the investor side and let's also talk the founder side. Um, I think that you know perhaps a lot of people have a perspective of sort of the Shark Tank style where you're going to you're going to get up in front of people and you're going to make a pitch and you have to impress them. And I would encourage uh, 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 organizations looking for investment to take a step back and uh, think about two things. The first is, you know, this should be a collaborative relationship between the investment community and the founder and the executives. Uh, and so for the executives and founders looking to outreach to investors, I'd say first do your homework. So understand who you're pitching to, uh, why you believe the pitch uh, and the product and the idea is gonna be a good match for their fund. A lot of funds, particularly mine, are mission driven and we wanna see an alignment of that mission and vision. Uh, we wanna understand um, uh, also, uh, 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 particularly for the, uh, uh, the, in, uh, uh, the founder himself or herself, what I'm looking for in particular is that that individual has a, uh, an extreme passion and authenticity and knowledge around the business and the idea that they're creating. Uh, founders and executives are going to face a huge amount of challenges. And so uh, we can't predict what those challenges are going to be. But the first thing I'm looking for is that their passion and their authenticity and their honesty around their idea is going to drive them through those challenges. And lastly, I'd say understand the timing of the investments. Um, sometimes it's it's very critical to know the funds you're reaching out to, what their finances look like, when they're raising, and when they are going to allocate capital. So having that collaborative relationship to understand who the who, the why, and the when of, of the outreach to the investor, and then when you meet with them, having that authenticity and passion, because ultimately that's what's going to stick in that first meeting. Great. And Mike? Sure. So uh, going last, uh, uh, maybe repackage uh, what 
others have said in our own way, because I think the fundamentals are essentially the same for all of us. We look for five T's uh, when we look at companies. And the first is timing. The single biggest reason startups fail is that it's the wrong time. In the case of these kinds of products, we've already concluded it's the right time for a host of reasons that we might get into during this panel. Uh, the second is technology science. Is there something about what you're making that's actually different than what has been made, what everybody else is making that in some way or another delivers a better, stronger, uh, more unique, uh, more defensible uh, experience. Uh, the third is the team. Who are you? Why are you the best of everybody on the planet at doing just what you're doing right now? Uh, there definitely are others doing what you're doing right now. Uh, so how can we know you're the best? Uh, and uh, the fourth for us is temperament. We believe strongly that Small groups of humans who love what they're doing and love one another can essentially accomplish anything. So are you that kind of leader? Are you creating that kind of culture? Because I think it was Henry said, it's all gonna change. You're gonna be uh, facing a tremendous indifference, tremendous asynchronous incoming surprises from the market. Almost everything you believe when you talk to us will turn out not to be true. So how are you gonna handle as a group all of that change. And then finally, terms. Uh, we invest to uh, produce return for our investors. And so the terms of the investments we make need to be appropriate to the risk. And if those things line up, uh, generally speaking, we will move forward. Uh, but, uh, uh, and then I guess the last thing for us, in some cases, it's pretty simple. We act, we're thesis driven. We meet twice a year as a fund to talk together and decide based on research exactly what we're going to do. And coming out of that meeting, I wrote a series of blog posts saying out loud exactly what we're paying attention to right now. So if you were looking at us and you look at what we say in public, that's what we're gonna be doing. So tie what you're saying to what we're saying out loud matters to us and it helps a lot. Well, Mike, you said something that I think we should really touch on for everyone. And it came when you mentioned timing. Right now is the time that, you know, that you think the timing is right for sex tech. Uh, so I'm going to go back to you, but I want to hear everybody. Why, why is the timing right for sex tech? And I'll, I'll just say this is a, a big panel. It's unwieldy. Normally, I want it to be a little bit more reactive. So I will go around to the group. But if you want to sort of pop your hand up and say, like, I have something to add, feel free, because we don't have to just go in circles. Um, but Mike, you mentioned timing. You've already decided timing is right for sex tech. Right. Why is that? Well, there are several reasons. I mean, we have a, a fund dedicated to individual health and through that, the delivery of happiness because we're looking at a lot of research that says on the science side, there are breakthroughs that make things possible that weren't possible before. A biofeedback loops, et cetera, is this actually causing a pleasurable experience for you that can now be ascertained in ways scientifically that weren't possible before. Uh, and on the human side, changes in attitude behavior. Uh, uh, from the rising generations. So women supporting women in everything related to being women is a clear worldwide forceful uh, set of activities. And uh, so we want to understand it when half the people on the planet decide they want things to be different. That matters to us. Um, and so we put all those together and this is one of the areas that emerges. And uh, if we look at actions related to it, they're rising. There are more companies in this space. There are more, uh, there's a stronger response from the market to companies in this space. It's happening all over the world. Uh, and uh, so uh, relative to everything else we look at, this seems to have the characteristics that could drive success. Great, and let's let's really? switch it up a little bit. Yeah, Gerda, what do you have to add? Yeah, no, I just really wanna agree, I think, I mean, timing can be right for so many different reasons. And of course, there's been a, a lot of people working for, for sex tech to get where it is today and, and timing is right. But I would say that for us at the case for her, one of the reasons that the timing is right is also that we see all of these amazing female entrepreneurs really taking on the female part of sexual wellness that hasn't been prioritized in the same way historically. And I mean, it comes with a wave of, of feminism and a lot of things happening, but we're also seeing backlash across the globe. So 
it's it's really interesting to see what's happening right now but i i would definitely say that we have been discussing uh, starting an investment portfolio in female sexual pleasure for a while uh, but then when we started seeing all of these great great entrepreneurs uh, coming out was really when we said okay the time is ready and now let's go and of course Polly Rodriguez was one of our first investments and I know she's been speaking here a lot but uh, I think uh, she is one of the perfect examples where there's there's um, both uh, brain and heart involved in her business and there is a founder that we know is going to make it. So, um, and then, you know, looking at the wellness side, I think that we care so much about how we sleep and how we eat and how much we train. And now suddenly we're realizing all the benefits that are coming with having a healthy and pleasurable sexual life which is, is also, of course, great uh, for, for us investors to be in a time when that's happening. Excellent. Does anyone else want to add to that in terms of the timing? Uh, go ahead, Carly. Yeah. Um, so we've been evaluating different markets because we're also looking at what strictly like women's health and then sex tech. And I think it's clear that the women's health space is a little bit more developed than the sex tech space and more widely accepted from an investor standpoint. Um, but that's not the case five, 10 years ago. I think a lot of women's health issues were really embarrassing five, even five years ago, egg freezing, things like this were, were not talked about um, in public, not talked about among investors because there was that stigma, menopause associated with it. Um, and I think that we've seen that, that stigma disappear and we've seen unicorns in the space. Uh, sex tech, I'd say, is definitely behind um, women's health. And I think that we are going to see that stigma disappearing. Right now, it's still there. Um, and I think having people in this room who are all at the forefront of it is really exciting. Um, but I think this is the right time because it's about to, uh, it has been, and it's, it's taking off now. That's my thoughts on it. And Henry, I saw your hand go up too. Uh, you're muted. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, something else that's, uh, a, 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 I guess, a general observation I'd have um, uh, working in the um, uh, in investment um, uh, space this year, I think is quite interesting because it's a very uncertain time. And, uh, you know, due to the, the um, uh, many global issues we've, we, we face today, I think that the desire for investors to find uh, secure businesses and um, ones that have a reduced risk of return is is attractive. And what you're seeing in the investment space is you're seeing uh, that companies that are organizations that can demonstrate that they are more uh, robust and or immune to some of the global challenges uh, end up getting a higher valuation due to the fact that they have, they're presenting with a potential lower risk um, uh, 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 for the overall business. And then on the other side, those that, that are, are more uh, prone to being disturbed by the global situation uh, may have reduced valuations because uh, they have an uncertain time over the next couple of years. So something I would uh, certainly consider as a piece of advice for founders and executives out there is, cert is over the next year or two, if you believe your uh, organization, your idea, your business, and your segment within sex tech uh, is going to be more um, defensible into, in, in regards to this uh, kind of global situation we face, which I think sex tech is uniquely positioned uh, to be able to um, uh, have, let's say, reduced risk, I think that's a powerful message that for investors that are looking for a secure place to put their money over the next couple of years, you're seeing funds move out of public spaces and looking for a home. And so this is a great time for uh, uh, segments like sex tech, which I think can be immune to many of the global challenges we face uh, and help bring people together in a way that's challenging right now um, uh, for investors leveraging that message, I think can also uh, attract some capital. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Uh, we're uh, seeing family offices or maybe similar to the one you work at, interested in this category. Uh, the public markets aren't what they used to be. They're thinking about what they're seeing in their own lives. They're uh, thinking about what they're feeling in their own lives. And 
of these areas are appearing to them to make a lot of sense in a way they might not have if the rest of the world were uh, less uh, uh, tumultuous uh, and they were in a different space. Uh, so yeah, I agree. Very attractive to many different kinds of investors now we're finding. And Aubrey, did you have anything to add to that? I just don't want to leave you out. You're muted as well. I don't know how I got on mute. Um, so the only thing that I would add is that um, during COVID, what we've seen, at least on the consumer side, is that also consumer spend in the vice categories is up. So in alcohol and alcohol delivery um, and in sex that like uh, and CBD as well. So um, so particularly now, I think you see a big tailwind behind these sort of pleasure industries. And so um, so I also think that makes it a good time. Excellent. So we do have a couple audience questions coming in and because they're the ones who we want to benefit from this knowledge, I wanna make sure we're feeding those in as much as possible. Uh, first one, what types of investment groups would you recommend that are interested in a tech upgrade to an existing sexual, and oh, this sounds pretty specific, but let me let me broaden it a little bit. So uh, there's, there's investment in, in companies that are just starting out with a new product of their own. There's also companies that maybe are doing work to enhance existing products or to, to be sort of a tech platform or support to the sex tech industry. Um, where, where are you looking in sex tech? That's a very broad term. So I think this is a great opportunity to talk about where are you looking in sex tech and why? And Aubrey, we'll just go back to you to kick us off. Where, where in sex tech? What does that mean for your fund? Yeah, so we, we look at a couple things. I look at it through a couple different lenses. So one is uh, in regard to the female consumer and the intersection of um, female health and sex tech. And so we've been looking at it, you know, that is a, a traditionally underserved market in the sex tech space and also a market that, you know, products designed for women have for a long time been uh, run by companies that are largely run by men. And so we see a big opportunity uh, there. We also look at it through the lens of virtual communities um, and new forms where, where community and content can come together. So we've seen a big uh, groundswell in the sex tech space of new forms of content. Um, like if you look at Quinn or the sex bot or lots of different things that have come out um, where there's a new sense of uh, of content delivery and how that services specific communities and specific use cases. Um, and then we do look at um, hardware, but hardware is hard. Uh, and so we uh, just given production cycles, inventory, all that. And so we have, I think, a higher bar for what hardware in the space looks like um, or any inventory based business. Um, but we, we like to think of it through those lenses. And what about you, Carly? Um, so as far as um, what I'm looking at in the sexual and sexuality space, we look at pretty much anything. <laughs> so we can get creative as far as what falls into sex tech, for instance, um, rape prevention, uh, at-home STI tests, RCD tests, uh, then sex toys, um, audio erotica, sexting bots, I think the whole range of it falls within our category, but uh, some things that wouldn't immediately, you would think be in the sex tech category can sometimes also uh, fall in the category. And since we look at wellness and health, things like birth control and um, all of those things fit into our categories, so we're pretty broad with what we would be looking at. And Gerda, what, what's your focus? Yeah, so our focus is definitely on anything that can help you to uh, nurture and grow your sexuality. But I'll, I would say that the way we look at it is the more you know about your body and the more comfortable you are to discuss things about sex and your sexuality, and the bigger are the chances that you will actually seek the services and the products that you need. 
um, and also if if you need help or anything feels wrong. So we're kind of looking at it from an educational standpoint. And I think toys can go under that, but also educational apps. I mean, audio erotica can be a way to, to explore your sexuality too, for example. But we also, uh, I think in, in comparison to, to the others on the panel without knowing them particularly well, we also do grants. Um, because we do believe that there's a lot of research needed to actually know what we need. So, for example, we have set out in El Salvador, El Salvador to explore what youth want in sex ed. And if that's a solution that could be a digital tech solution, and if we could provide funding for that solution. But we start already way back. So we actually go in with a human-centered design focus and we ask people in El Salvador or youth and their parents about what kind of sexual education they would like and what they need. Um, and of course, pleasure-based sex ed is, is the answer that a lot of people come with. But we, so, so we can even grant money to do research that then might lead up to an investment. But then, of course, we also look at other investments. But I would say that for us, the, the key component is that it has to be educational in some way. And, and for us, as I said before, it, we have a female focus on our investments. Henry? Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what, what I look for, what we look for, and then also a bit from the industry space. So for, for us, again, uh, our focus is on improving quality of life through uh, consumer technology and medical technology. Our uh, uh, focus and experience is a bit weighted more towards the um, uh, uh, the uh, addressing and resolution of of challenges in the in the in the healthcare space that then can translate into, particularly in the area of sex tech, empowerment, uh, uh, digital, um, uh, any of these things that will improve quality of life uh, for. Uh, for uh, the um, potential customers. But what I'd also say is you can hear through the responses of many people on this panel that everybody has a very clear uh, understanding of what their vision is and where they're going to make their investments. And uh, uh, something Gerda said I think is particularly critical, which is that um, uh, there are a lot of opportunities open for investment and funding, everything from grants through uh, family office, family and friends, up to major you know, venture capital rounds and all the rest. And I cannot stress enough for our participants that they've got to do their homework to understand what is their vision, what is their mission, uh, do they have the right team in, in place, and then to go out and research and, uh, and uh, 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 hire uh, a team or an individual or, or spend the time to be able to discover which of these potential investment partners and investment strategies are going to be right for them and are going to help them reach the next milestone to be able to increase value on their technology and move the product and the company forward. So um, uh, the, uh, the, the first thing that, that, these, that organizations need to do is to understand themselves and to have the passion around what they do and then do their work to find that right fit. And again, it's not about just getting up in front of a thousand people and then hopefully one person says, we'll give you some money. This is about saying, this is what we do. This is what we're passionate about. And we want to partner with you on the investment side because you're also passionate about this and we think there's a great match. And so if you understand what you do and then as you listen to us, you understand what the, what the investment side is doing and have a good strategy there, then it should be a really hand in glove partnership that, um, uh, that can help you then secure that investment in a much more uh, efficient way. And Mike, I think you already touched on this a little bit, what you guys are looking at, but is there any, any more specificity you want to add in terms of what kinds of companies' products you would consider? Uh, well, just we, two things. We don't try and prejudge the case. So it's not like we're sitting around in a group saying, we know what's going to happen. We're looking for this, that, and the other. We're looking at the space. Uh, we are looking at a lot of companies in spaces we care about to pick up. What are the entrepreneurs doing? What are the people out there on earth doing? That's what matters. It doesn't matter so much what we think. We need to be a reflection of what they do and what they're making possible. Uh, 
Um, and so we often wind up in areas we didn't even know about uh, or didn't expect to be impressed by, but when we see what the entrepreneur is doing and we see the reaction we do, and it's not just about sex toys or some narrow definition of pleasure. So we have platforms, uh, Medora, which is uh, a very deeply scientific device uh, divine, uh, designed to help postmenopausal women with uh, vaginal dryness so they can be in a biological position to uh, take uh, more uh, greater advantage of pleasure or rosy which is a combination of content and community driven by a set of female doctors aimed at giving women uh, pathways to uh, uh, handle uh, low libido and all the things that come from it as well as uh, just things inside the head all of this resides in the head so uh, pleasure is a neurological experience and uh, the inability to uh, address pleasure is a neurological problem. So we're looking uh, very broadly at any set of ideas that uh, might come from any uh, angle that we think has the potential to impact a lot of people on the ground. Great. Well, the audience questions keep coming in, which is excellent. My um, yeah. I want to touch on one more thing on that question. Of course, please uh, do. So I run the Female Founded Club, um, as well as Recognition Ventures, and it's a platform to help female founders raise capital. Um, and I see a lot of sexual uh, sex tech companies come through there. And I think it's really important for founders uh, to understand, part of the question was what types of investment groups would be interested. And I think it's important for founders to kind of be able to see behind the scenes of an investment group and what kind of restrictions they might have, um, where those are stemming from. And I think this is something that a lot of founders might not understand. Um, and I'm sorry if I'm, I'm just telling the audience things I already know. Um, but a lot of venture capital funds, especially big name funds, will have a vice clause with their LPs, which restricts them from investing in a vice related area like sex tech. You might know that, but thinking about um, family offices won't have that vice clause for the most part. But if a family that the family office is representing is conservative, they might not be so interested in the space. But if they're more liberal and um, really doing your research on the investor, an angel investor won't have that vice clause. You can look at angel investors as a real, as a really good example. Um, and then there are funds that don't have the vice clause, and you can look at what funds have invested in vice-related companies before, and you'll know that they're open to that kind of investment. So I think, um, and I help my founders understand this, but I, I think it's something that's important when you're looking at, you think like, oh, this is a great investor you'll have to really think like, yeah, they might love your company, but because of their bias class restrictions or conservative LPs or conservative family, they won't be able to look at the space. And at the risk maybe of getting a little controversial here, uh, we and I as an individual don't buy the notion that personal pleasure is a vice. Personal pleasure is an experience. Um, it's among all kinds of different experiences people have. And uh, the smell of vanilla, uh, can make you feel really good. Uh, Home-baked bread can make you feel good. Different kinds of vibrations can make you feel good. Different kinds of thoughts can make you feel good. Some folks get off on the high sea in an opera. So uh, we don't judge. It's uh, We say the future isn't uh, uh, better or worse than the present. It's just different. And so we don't try and apply what we think to what's happening. It's up to the world and we're a worldwide fund. So that whole concept of Christian sin is not a big thing in Japan. There's a whole set of different issues in Japan, but that's not one of them. So uh, we're looking at things that way. It, uh, people in the end will get what they choose. They will get what they want. And we're here to understand what they want and to understand what's possible and to try and help those connections happen without imposing the point of view of a, you know, old, rich, white guy, or any other point of view. It's not up to us, it's up to them. Yeah, and I don't think you're gonna find anyone at this event who, who, who thinks it's a vice either. I think that that's one thing that this group is in agreement with, but unfortunately, uh, the social platforms and the regulators uh, don't always agree with us, but, but that's a really good point. Um, let's see. Let's read this question. An investor has said that he, this industry has difficulty getting investors because this field is uh, considered a sin. So people typically, well, I, 
I think we pretty much just addressed that. Does anyone want to talk yeah. about that a little more based on, on addition to what Mike said? Um, you know, it, the question is, do most people invest anonymously? You all are here speaking publicly, so I'm guessing none of you are, are anonymous investors. But, um, you know, this gets to a question we discussed on our prep call that might be good for the group, which is um, how you talked to your partners or, or any, any of your professional fellows about getting into this space. Um, so, Aubrey, I'm going to go back to you. What, what are your thoughts on how you spoke to your team on about getting into sex tech and why it was worth the potential risk or maybe the perceived risk? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a there's a couple there's a couple things there. One is um, as the entrepreneur, just knowing how different firms and different investors stand on this stuff. Um, you can have an active dialogue about if they have a vice clause in their fund and who's open about it. Um, I think um, so. I and I think that that's changing a lot. You know, I think maybe three to five years ago, this was way more taboo than it is now. I just I think that you know, companies like Maud and Unbound and um, O School and some of like the really early successes have sort of blown through the door to, to justify why this is a good uh, investment category. And I think ultimately as an investor, um, you know, I justify this space the way I justify any other space. Like <laughs> I think it's about, um, you know, maximizing returns for our investors. And so, um, so I look at, you know, a, to me, this is a, at least a few years ago when I was looking at it, you know, a classic case of an industry that was sort of moth eaten and underserved for a long time. There wasn't a lot of innovation. Um, there wasn't sort of modern brands speaking to modern consumers. And so um, I found, you know, a big white space in a market that is bit like by dollars, very big. And so um, I justified it the way that I would justify any other investment opportunity. And I think you know, m more and more investors are doing the same. I just want to follow up on that real quick, which is, you know, did you get specific pushback that was different than, you know, your justifications were the same? Was your response of your partners the same? Uh, um, that's a good follow up question. Yeah. Um, I think initially one of the concerns was actually around follow on risk. So it wasn't actually us investing. It was more, okay, if we invest at the series A, our other investors, our, our first round, are some of these other big marquee firms going to be okay putting money into this? And what did their advice clauses look like? And, and is the industry ready for this? Um, and so, again, I think with time, that gets shown. <laughs> you know, the results show for themselves. Um, and I think especially when you get into the later stage round, as, as data becomes more and more the driver of round economics, um, right. you know, the proof is sort of in the pudding. Right. Um, but I do think early days that that was a big risk. And so um, some of that too was to bridge that gap was me having active conversations with later stage company, you know, later stage investment companies to say, how do you guys think about the space? What are you looking for? What would really wow you um, to just be prepared and to also help equip my entrepreneurs with, okay, here's, here's the milestones that you need to get to to series A. Um, but but I, I do really think, I don't know how the other panelists agree or not, but I do think that there's been a shift, you know, I think politically, socially, I think like the world has opened up a little bit more and, and liberalized to this. And so I think that's being reflected on the investment side as well. I, if I can jump Go ahead, in. No, so I, I, I just really want to agree that I think that it's changing, but I would say that there's so many issues still, uh, especially around racism. Uh, unfortunately, in this field, there is uh, a big belief. Uh, we get to hear it all the time. Women in Africa don't care, care about their sexual pleasure. They don't have time for that. They have time for other things. All of these things that are being said to us. Um, the most common question I get asked is, why do you invest in, in menstruation and sex? Why don't you invest in HIV prevention? Well, maybe using, uh, you know, a pleasure-based approach or, or erotifying um, safe sex can actually be a great way of, of uh, preventing HIV or getting people to uh, go to the hospital when they have an STI. So but even though it's, it's, it's changing and it's, it's definitely a different world than, than four years ago, I would say that there's still a global issue. Uh, and if you go 
you know, not, I'm based in Sweden. So here it's open and okay. The US has a big sector. I know parts of, of Asia and also Europe. But if you go beyond that, there's still a lot of, of questions uh, around this. Um, and I do think that at case for her, unfortunately, we do use a little bit of different language depending on where we speak. So when I speak to you guys, I talk about our pleasure portfolio, which is what we call it at the office. But when I go into negotiations with the UN and why the UN should use pleasure-based approaches, I talk about wellness straight through. Um, I once, uh, just as a fun anecdote, uh, at a conference uh, in, uh, at the UN in Nairobi, uh, this was back in the days before we had uh, named our portfolio a pleasure portfolio. Uh, it was the orgasm portfolio and I started speaking and half the room left. So there's still a big issue when you're trying to push it uh, on a lot of other agendas. But I think that as the field is growing and we're showing how education and health comes into sex tech and sex so much, we're actually, it's going to change. It's going to change and it's changing, but it, it's, it's definitely a, a little bit <laughs> left to go. Uh, I think uh, our experience as fun may pick up kind of interestingly on, on both those comments and, and particularly on what Aubrey had to say. So we began investing here uh, a couple of years ago, maybe even three years ago. And when the numbers began showing these phenomena, that there's new possibilities here, women are supporting women, uh, more than half the team in our uh, fund are female. And they range in 20s, 30s, 40s. 50s, uh, uh, multiple cultures, Japanese American. And this first came up uh, to us through research. But when the research started to indicate that this was happening, it was the female partners in our funds who in partner meetings said, this is for real. These products are really good and we really use them. And you have to pay attention to this. You can't react to this, talking to me and the founder uh, differently than you would any other category. The numbers are the numbers, the actions are the actions, and you have to do it. And, uh, uh, and it uh, uh, almost became incumbent upon us. I have to admit, the founder here, when he heard our uh, female team members talking about, well, the wands and the orbs, and the orbs are actually much better than the wands. And, and you know, <laughs> what, don't you want us to test the products out? Don't you want us to know what the experience is like? We would do this, we would try the chocolate. We would, you know, put the brain uh, 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 headset on, and uh, and so in the end, we did uh, listen to them and look at the numbers and come in. And I have to say now, you know, the founder in our fund is like running around with Polly Rodriguez T-shirts on. Uh, he thinks she's great. He thinks the company is great, and that's because in the end, seventy percent gross margin is seventy percent gross margin. A million customers is a million customers, and that goes back to this question of we saw that when we first got in. There's a really clear issue here. We can find a company right now. We can find really interesting characteristics right now. And will the A-Round support be there? We don't know. So for us in this category, particularly, endurability was really important. That means really strong products, really great gross margin, cheap, tough uh, entrepreneurs that we felt would endure, would pull this thing back to $1 more coming in, going out, if they had to at any moment and would simply keep the company going until the market came around. And that's exactly what we've seen. Really strong performance, really strong discipline. Um, and the market's coming around. Now, uh, coming out of COVID, there are gonna be all kinds of companies more interested in these areas than they were before because they gotta find an audience somehow. And they're reading the numbers that you know, all this kind of behavior is going up. So. Um, it was a whole range of things, uh, but one reason why we backed the companies we did is we felt that among all the companies available, they had the highest endurance factor so that they could stay around until other investors kind of caught up with them. And Henry, what about you? Did, did you have pushback from your partners? Uh, no. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I, 
again, for us, you know, we've come from the environment of, um, of improving quality of life, typically on the healthcare side into consumer technology. And so uh, approaching technology within the sex tech space from that angle, uh, it was not a challenge for us. But again, we are we have a focus and we're going to invest in organizations that uh, achieve that mission. So you could have the most amazing, I don't know, financial technology company that's going to make a bajillion dollars. And we're, we're just not interested. That's not what we do. And there are areas of sex tech that we're going to be more interested in. Again, things that address uh, 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 challenges on health, uh, that improve quality of life, and then ones that we might be less interested in. Um, and back to what I think a number of the panelists said, though, I think we can't deny that uh, this is an emerging industry uh, that will have uh, challenges, that will have detractors from an investment standpoint. Um, but that doesn't mean that the business is not there. Uh, as you know, as Mike just said, the business can be defendable. What I worry about is what some of the other panelists said. I worry about follow-on risk. I worry about channel strategy, right? It, you know, there are on the social platforms, uh, you know, there are a number of organizations we work with, with which have their ads taken down because they violate a uh, certain code of conduct. Is th those are the more the challenges that we want to see uh, uh, founders and executives uh, work through. I'm not worried about the business being there, uh, but again, it, you know, it comes back to the the, the match and the fit between the uh, investment community and the organization. And um, there are ways that 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 individuals need to go about ensuring they're targeting the right groups. You know, uh, when I was working on the corporate side, you know, two great resources that if if you're if, if teams are not using these, they should. Basic things like Crunchbase and PitchBook to do research on companies that are similar to the one that you're, uh, that you're working with. What was their investment strategy? Who did they go to? Because again, as panelists said, you, know, you might have a really great investment firm you wanna work with, but if they don't invest in the space, you're not gonna convince them otherwise. What you wanna do is find that investment partner that's going to have a history in this space that's gonna understand it, and is going to ask those sophisticated questions and not get hung up on some of the, on some of the challenges. I think what is unfortunate is we do we are in a space where language is important and calling it uh, wellness versus sexual health versus orgasm. These these things are unfortunately the kind of the environment that we that we work in. But uh, but if you're selecting the right partners to go and pitch to, I, I think you can you can be honest and you can. Um, uh, demonstrate the knowledge and passion you have for the business. Uh, and again, as uh, from our particular side of things, uh, if that fits in our mission of improving quality of life uh, with with uh, consumer technology or within health, we're all in. We don't we don't uh, we're not going to discriminate against a particular type of product. Excellent, great. So we have questions flying in from the audience, and we are down to to less than 15 minutes left, although I might let, it, I might let you guys have a little extra time because there's so much to cover. Um, some of those are old, so let's go to the, these ones. Uh, okay, so I'm curious about due diligence. Um, where are you getting reliable information and data about the sex tech industry? And just to switch it up, let's start with Gerda and go right to the middle. <laughs> Yeah, probably you're asking the, the the wrong person. I think we've been in, we live and breathe what we're doing at Case for Her. And, and a lot of the times you kind of feel things a lot. It sounds so unprofessional when you say it, but you know, you, you've seen enough of successes and enough failure and you kind of, again, the team is of such importance. Um, so, I mean, the due diligence process, I would say for us and where we get the data, I mean, it varies from country to country, of course, but um, there are some research out there, but a lot of it is actually in the end, just the, the feeling you have when you get pitched. And I think the five T's is a great, example of the five things that every one of us looks at and, and how that, yeah. And, and then a lot of things within sex tech, it's hard to evaluate, like, is there a market for this? 
well, do we know if it hasn't existed yet, how are we going to evaluate if there's a market or willingness to pay for it? Um, so yeah, it, it's a, it's a hard question. I, I'm happy to learn from, from my fellow panelists. Somebody want to address this? How, how are you learning? Uh, go ahead, Carly. Well, I just uh, came across a group called the Modality Group. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of them, but they're really a uh, sex tech intelligence group. I haven't used them, but they're recommended to me from Cindy Gallup. So uh, they can do your research for you, they're consultants. So a little plug there. Well, thank you for that. And Lex Gillen, <laughs> who's the founder of Modality, is actually moderating our final panel today. So more opportunities to learn from them. And, and uh, I've conducted an interview with her. I think they're great. So great suggestion, awesome. Carly. Anybody else? Uh, well, I'll talk about it. Uh, so <clears throat> part of my background was as the geek who started and ran the world's largest PC network product testing laboratory. So I'm a product tester by inclination and background. So we would test. I mean, in the case of something like this, uh, 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 pleasure products in, in particular. Um, if these are products designed to uh, give uh, certain kinds of individuals pleasure, are they? Are individuals buying them? Are they using them? When one asks them about them, do they say positive things about them in the same way they would any other uh, uh, product? Are our uh, team members or our LPs or the broader folks in our communities, and our communities are big because our phones are worldwide and we're really active. Are they using them? Are they talking about them? Are they bringing this up to us as a change in their experience? It's the uh, age old sort of Wall Street. If you're in an area and you see everybody you know using it, you're learning something. If you're in an area and you see everybody you know not lose, using it, you're, lear you're learning something else. So they're just some basics we would bring to any a uh, product and uh, uh, quite a few of our team are scientists. So we would tend to view this scientifically. Any proof? Any proof that this works? Any proof that this works better than anything else that was there before? And if there is proof and there is behavior related to that proof, then we're, we're interested. That doesn't mean we'll invest, but it means we'll explore. And if we explore a lot of companies in a short period of time, we believe we're going to start to get some three dimensionality about what's going on. And that would give us enough of a perspective to uh, produce some confidence about some of those companies. And that's what happened here. Great. Um, anyone else? Okay. Uh, when, when people are coming to you for investment, how important is it that they already have a team in place or are you okay with a solo founder coming in and pitching an idea? What, what level of, of, establishment do they really need to be at for you? Um, and Aubrey, I'll start with you. Um, so there's there's not a cut and dry answer on this, but um, we're looking for, you know, if, if you're a solo founder, that's fine. Um, but we want to see, you know, you want to show as much progress toward your goals as possible. So one, someone needs to be full time on the idea. You know, someone needs to have skin in the game. Second, um, maybe you don't have your team lined up, but if you can show, hey, I've identified these candidates. As soon as I get this investment, this person's coming on to lead marketing. This person's coming on to be my technical founder, whatever. Um, I think if you can do that work up front, it helps de-risk that, you know, who your team is uh, as a question. Um, and then the other thing is just, you know, I think there, there are different risk levers that we look at. And so, you know, if you, maybe you don't have a full team in place, but the pro you've been focusing really on the product, or maybe you don't have a product, but you have this really rabid community that's been primed. So I think as the entrepreneur, you want to think about what I often say is like, what are the like standout data points that you can show early on. You don't have to have all of them, but there has to be something that gets us excited. Um, and so I would say focus on, on that. Anybody else? Yeah, I'd agree with that. Well, we back single founder companies, <clears throat> but uh, it's generally when the performance is just completely off the charts. We had one, one person, it's in beverages, uh, sort of healthy beverages, who had on her own making it, bottling it, delivering it, 
coming up with the initial approach, a half a million dollars in revenue just on individual effort with no support at all. And we felt that it was worth it to find out what that person could do with a little bit of uh, wind or sales. Uh, uh, statistically speaking, multi-founder uh, companies do better. They are more likely to succeed than single founder companies. And we're numbers driven. So in the end, the question isn't sort of just you, but think about it. Uh, you're you, and then there's a group in Israel that's six PhDs that's doing something like what you're doing. And there's a group in Japan where two world-class product designers who are doing what you're doing. Are you on your own really better than all of them? You might be, but the odds say probably not. Because we don't yet know if you're on your own, whether your next hire is an incredible person who's smarter than you and better than you and will make things better or just somebody you know. So the more of those kinds of things we can know relative to all the choices we have, the easier you're making it for us to uh, choose you. Uh, go ahead, Henry. Yeah, just to add to that, um, you know, we typically will invest in organizations that are on the smaller side, so small to medium. And so uh, we've certainly invested in organizations that are, you know, one or two individuals uh, through to the groups that have a team that's in place. And I'd say two, there are two critical aspects to it. The first is that as a founder or an executive, when you approach an investor, you need to have a very clear understanding about where that investment is going to take you and what are the milestones that you're going to accomplish and how does that create a valuation inflection for a return investment for the investor or the next investment that's going to come in. And so it's a warning sign if you're an individual person and you say, oh, well, boy, my experience is all about, you know, engineering, but I'm going to get this money and then, you know, I've never done this before, but we're going to uh, produce this and we're going to manufacture it and we're going to sell it and we're going to, you know, do all these things. I don't have those people in place yet, but, you know, give me some money. That's obviously a much higher risk when I'm looking at that individual uh, or investment. And if that person says all those things, yeah, that's a much higher risk investment. But if that person says, hey, my experience is engineering, and I'm going to take this and we're going to take it to this uh, point, which is about finishing the product. And that's what I know how to do. And then the next stage, we're going to get another group of investors, and we're going to, you know, hire up a team and go to this, you know, next position in the company, you know, then, then I'm evaluating that individual, that founder to accomplish that particular goal. Mm -hmm. As uh, some of the panelists have said, though, um, getting the team together is critical. And to pick off something Mike said, um, uh, you know, one of the things that I really watch out for at small organizations is particularly when you have a small company, every individual you add to that company changes the DNA of the company. And so it becomes very difficult um, if that team is not in place to be able to keep the mission and the values consistent. It's really hard to do uh, because you're sort of splitting the DNA of the company with each individual you bring on. So you really have to look at that individual founder or group of founders and, and judge them on their ability to be able to keep the, the values of the organization consistent and the focus of the organization consistent. And so again, it is a high risk, but it depends on what is being asked of the investment and where it's going to take you. Um, and so, uh, so I think that, uh, that executives and founders should consider that as they're, as they're determining when is the right stage to go and go and get that next level of investment. Anybody else? Uh, we had a question about uh, female founders in this space. So in general, I think we all sort of understand that, that it's been harder for female founders to get funding. But as you can see from the speaker faculty for this event, there are a lot of female founders in the sex tech space. Do you think that trend is, is consistent, that the trend in normal investment is, is consistent also in sex tech? And also, I, I want to tag onto this a, a lead into our inclusion panel at the end. What's the responsibility of as investors to consider in inclusion and broadening the uh, diversity of an industry? Is is that your responsibility? Do you do you consider it? And I'm feeling because we have such a different mix of types of investors, we'll get different answers. But Henry, we haven't had you start yet, so I'm going to start with you. I would say on the diversity and inclusion side, uh, absolutely. I mean, if if it's not your responsibility, whose responsibility is it? Um, and, uh, you know, not just from a social responsibility standpoint, but 
just from good business sense. I mean, you know, I don't have to uh, debate, I don't think we have to debate or argue the point that a diverse and inclusive uh, uh, organization is going to is going to perform better. They're going to have a better return. And so uh, that's got to be something that is critical. And again, for uh, early stage founders, one of the things that they're going to be asked to do is they're going to be asked to build the team to accomplish that goal. And they need to demonstrate that they've got a the founder or the original have all the answers, but they have to be able to recruit a diverse and experienced team that's going to take them to that next level. So, so certainly, um, I think to your, to your point, uh, or the, 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 the first part of the question, uh, I think this is a challenge that we see, uh, all over and it's, it's not only the responsibility of, uh, of the founders and the executives to champion diversity and inclusion in their, in their, uh, uh, their organizations, but it's also a responsibility for investors and board members to champion that as well. I mean, we, as, uh, as our portion of this relationship, need to be supporting uh, diverse businesses and encouraging our executives and founders to uh, be inclusive and that we appropriately, uh, when, when assisting or selecting board representation for these organizations, also champion that diversity. It doesn't, it doesn't work for us to hold them accountable and then have a completely homogenous board that's going to run the company. So I think that I think it goes both ways, and I think it is a challenge. But I think everybody on this panel, as well as everybody in the audience, has a responsibility to champion where we can. Who wants to speak to that next? I'm I'm going to let you guys raise your hand if you ever want to add to that. Uh, okay, I see a lot. So let's say uh, Gerda first. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to agree. I think that, I mean, everyone has to champion it, champion it, but I also think that there's definitely a bias within the sector, within investments in, in, in full. And I mean, again, women of color within that group, or if you're not a heterosexual, you know, so of course, I mean, I think the investment space needs to really, really shape up uh, and become more inclusive. Um, and unfortunately, I mean, it's, it's easier to say sometimes than do, but I think the responsibility lies within everyone. But to start those conversations and start pointing it out, and I think there's been a few really good articles lately and reports on, on where where people are investing. And it's really important to just um, know what's happening and seeing it within our own organization, even though we're maybe our own organization is, uh, is uh, has diversity, it doesn't mean that investments in the end have it. Uh, I think I saw Aubrey maybe wanting to respond to that. Okay, go ahead, Aubrey. Yeah, yeah. And I actually, I have to jump to my, I have um, another meeting that I have to prep for, but I, I wanted to at least thank you guys for having me on the panel and then I'll speak to this and then if that's all right, I, I have to bounce. Absolutely. Um, but, um, but yeah, so a couple things. One, I think sometimes um, it's important to acknowledge progress and where we have to go. So I, uh, I was raising capital for my company in 2012 and 2013, and it was so much worse than it is now. Like it was sort of pre me too. And, uh, and I had some sort of horrifying experiences. Um, and I think that, so I think it's good to acknowledge that there is, um, real work that has been done and like good actors in the ecosystem. Um, you know, I think all rays and groups like that have been really helpful in sort of pushing that agenda forward. And I think the fact that uh, panelists like your, you know, like panels like your, this one we're on right now where this conversation keeps getting brought up, I think is super important that it keeps being part of the dialogue. Um, but I think there's still more work to go here. Um, you know, I think if you look in the sex tech industry, um, if you actually look across the the number of founders that there are, there's a lot of women in this space. There is, I would say majority founders that I've seen are women. But if you actually look at the venture dollars in this space, um, it actually is going to companies founded by men. So Roe and Hims combined, which I would consider sex tech companies, 
I think outshine like most companies combined in terms of venture actual venture dollars that go to them. So while I think the number of companies getting started, you know, is becoming more equitable, I think that there's still a huge disparity in this in this space that mirrors the wider trends in the industry that we're not done yet. And I think um, a lot of, you know, especially what Greta was saying, I think part of what needs to happen in the industry is it needs to take a look at itself and take a look at its bias. Um, and I think a lot of that is around how entrepreneurs present. What does it mean to be somebody who shows leadership in a room? What does it mean to be somebody who shows poise? What does it mean to be somebody who shows vision? Like, I think a lot of those things are very uh, gendered and, and biased. And so, um, so I think that that's, you know, I think they're like, I said, I don't discount the fact that the, the reason I have my current job after selling my company is because there were great male investors who said she she looks, walks, and talks like a woman and she should be on our investment committee. Um, but I think that there um, I think that there's still a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done, not just for females, but for um, any underrepresented minorities that are in the ecosystem. Well, uh, I've let us run a bit over time. I'm usually more of a stickler, but there was so much to say. Um, so I want to thank you, Aubrey. I know you have to jump. I want to thank all of our panelists. I wish I could have another hour. I think there's another hour of conversation here. Um, if you're able to stick around and join in the chat and answer any more questions that popped up, we'd love for you to do so. And just thank you again for joining us. This has been a fascinating and really valuable conversation. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Yes.